Blood satellite. I started, uh, you know, I think a lot of people were on the path that I was on, or we were all on years ago, where we were getting into crypto and uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and Dogecoin and everything like that. And uh, a lot of people are very good at learning the rules of crypto, of learning how it works, learning the tech behind it, and making a lot of money on it. But I think there's some people who still were naysayers about cryptocurrency because maybe they they just hate trading, they hate speculation, they hate everything. As, as they should, I think, because I maintain that, you know, if you are investing in crypto, you should probably do it just because you like the technology and you want something that means something to our people, because we might very well have to be using crypto in the near future as we're kicked out of all right. the banks. But, you know, trying to figure out, but why do people do this? You know, the types of people who would who would like crypto are also the people who are very, very critical of the financial institutions that exist right now. And they're critical of usury. They're critical of pump and dump schemes, of buying low just to sell high, things like that. And I think to really wrap your head around crypto, you can you can do well in trading crypto. You can make a lot of money. But I wanted to know more about why we have speculation at all. Like, Why do we do this? Why did we make these systems to begin with? Uh, because the crypto market isn't entirely dissimilar from the regular financial market, really. It's just right. it's different tech, but a lot of the rules still apply. And that's why people will say, like, this is why you should invest in crypto, because it's actually not this new thing. Same rules apply. It's not so scary. But I, I needed to answer the question just for me, and I think other people do too. Like, but why do we do it? Why do we do this at all? Why do we why do we speculate, period? Like, why do we have usury? Like what Let's say we get rid of usury, which people have done in the past. How do we yeah. ensure that usury doesn't come back? What What's the deeper issue at play here about why we even do this thing that we engage in this game where it seems that historically there's booms and busts and people, some people get rich, a lot of people get poor. And we, we're good at learning the rules, but not figuring out like why this even exists. So I wanted to kind of get into that and not just the logic behind it, but maybe the history of it. One of the books I had read was uh, The Devil Take the Hindmost, A History of Financial Speculation by Edward Chancellor. This is a pretty famous book, The De Devil Take the Hindmost. So this is just a, a entire history of what speculation is, how it evolved through Europe. And that's important to keep in mind that, you know, the financial market as we know it isn't this universal thing, really. You know, stock speculation, centralized markets really did just emerge in Europe. It's not like China really had their own version of it. South America did. Ancient empires didn't just have this thing. It was, we can pinpoint exactly where and when it started and why it started. And so that's kind of what I wanted to learn. Like, what? Why did people decide one day to start doing this weird thing? Um, and just to give a brief history and give a, a brief overview of the terms and maybe answer the question about why we do speculation at all. So the claim made in the book, and the book cites a lot of you know historical evidence and quotes from people, but the explanation that the book came up with that I, I kind of like is that it's tied to a deeply human need to divine the future and be part of something big. And these are almost deeply psychological, maybe even emotional things like no, remove money from it, remove, you know, capital gain from it. The idea that this is why we also gamble in a way. It's like, yeah, we want to make money, but we also just like betting on things. We just like, you know, saying, I think this will happen. You think let's just see, even if, even if there's no money attached to it. But there's almost a deeply civilizational, maybe even spiritual desire to predict the future. And if you remove money from it, that you're still going to have that. And so this would tie into the argument that let's say we, we live in a moneyless society. Let's say there's no dollars, there's no petrodollars, there's no nothing. You would still have gambling. You would still have people trying to figure out a way to attach some value to predictions. And that's the way I think you have to look at this. It's like, it's not even about money. It's just attaching value to predictions. And even in a Star Trek society, you would still have they would claim that this isn't in the future, but why wouldn't you have just a different type of degenerate gambler, a different type of guy thinking he should be a future predictor? 
Um, and a lot of these companies, like a, and if you look at what typically causes a rush, this is what we found in a lot of the cases is that when you look at a crazy market rush, a crazy bubble, a, a company that's inflated that everyone wants to invest in, it's a mania, right? A lot of the times these start not with people hungry for capital and to get rich, but just they want to be a part of something. You want to be part of something big. You want to be in the upswing of something. So if you hear that everyone's going somewhere, you just kind of want to go. So companies play with this. Like I got a new tech. I got a new, a new thing. We discovered a new country and there's, there's big things happening and you don't even really need to know the details of what it is. You just know that something big is happening for your civilization and you want to be a part of it. Okay, just to reiterate the point that people actually just, unless we solve the problem of people wanting to predict the future and people wanting to be part of something, and that's what it is, and it manifests itself in the stock market in in monetary ways, in, in money and capital. But, you know, the idea is that, like we had just said, if you are... Uh, if, if there's a guerrilla revolution and a guerrilla movement in a country, they tend to be very small. But and we covered this in War of the Flea when we covered that book. Once a revolution takes over, if you ask the average person, they want to tell you that they helped. They want to tell you that they were involved. And there is something and I don't know if it's broken down by ethnicity, race, religion, whatever. But there is something in each and every one of us that wants to say that we're part of something bigger that is socially relevant. So in a way, you can look at, you know, if you like Tesla, if you like these electric cars, a lot of people are just investing because they want to be part. They get the feeling that they're part of some kind of green tech revolution. Know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is that is like a deeper thing about why we do these things. Um, but it's funny that when we talk about stock market speculation, going back to um, when it started, you know, speculation is always seen as destroying work e ethic, upsetting the social order, and dependent on insane vanity. And this is something established early in the book because we've had usury for a long time, like the concept of usury. And that if and the concept of speculation and people making money off of speculation and throughout history, hundreds of thousands of years, you know, the, if you look at these ancient texts, they're always saying, yeah, but that that destroys society. Yeah. And I think they were right to a degree because it's anti work ethic. It's just people making money off of people making money. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how they saw it. And they would build their entire economic systems around this truth or a truth as they saw it. So I always thought that was kind of interesting that this is a complete 180 on that. And, uh, and we had, a, we always had in various cultures in ancient China, in, in South America, there was this idea of the guy who likes usury as being bad. And it's funny that even in the book, and I'll talk, get to this in a second, but even in the book, when they talk about the founding of the original uh, stock market, what we know today as the stock market, as a big place where people meet to trade stocks, was started in like Antwerp. And the book says this is because Jews were fleeing to Antwerp. <laughs> <laughs> like there's this is a liberal book this is a mainstream press this isn't a, a one of our books but if you're telling the history of financial speculation and usury you cannot tell that history without talking about jews like i'm yep. sorry yep. that if you're being historical you'll say look there was a lot of jews that were fleeing persecution sure say that but they decided to ply their trade in these <laughs> countries that had them. And they gave yeah. the Netherlands was big for this. Like the Netherlands became the financial capital of the world in, in a lot of ways, in, in many serious ways and had their own stock market. But, you know, you cannot talk about that without talking about the importance of Jews in that. And it even, um, there's examples in the book where it's like, we're talking about the history of the financial market. Let's say you're just a guy in London in you know, the 1600s and you want to buy a stock. So you wander down to the coffee house and you find a Hasidic Jew. <laughs> like They describe that if you wanted to buy stocks, like you were most likely to be talking to a guy with curly locks in the front. That's just what it is. Yeah. You, if I want to buy a stock, I want to trade. I got to find a Jewish guy who's hanging out in a pub because that's where you would do it. You would actually trade. But, but prior to like a bunch of like sweaty guys screaming on a floor, you would just go to a public house and you would say, I want to put and they write on a piece of paper on their hand on a fucking beer soaked bar. And then you, now you kind of own it. But you know, this is before it got very big. But yeah, you had find yourself a Jew and buy a, a part of a company. 
And uh, I think, and one thing that's kind of mentioned in this, but I think it's important to note is that as the rise of speculation occurs, this is where you start to see the rise of the labor theory of value proposed by Marx and many other Marxists. So, because at this point, once you introduce the idea of speculation, this idea that you can you can do this thing, you start wondering what what, what is value then? Like, what is value? How can money just multiply? How can money just grow based on interest, based on a uh, mania? How does that make sense? So, the labor theory of value, I I see as growing alongside this as a way to at least try to establish a thing called value. Like, okay, how do we actually establish value? Well, perhaps value is measured by how much human labor you put into it, which actually as a, you know, a lot of people don't like the Marx labor theory of value. I don't dislike it as, as far as monetary theories go, the idea that one way to conceptualize how something is valuable is like how much work did it make to create it or how much work did it take to pull it out of the ground or grow it? Like we can say certain minerals are more valuable or, or you know, can be priced higher because it's actually harder to find them and extract them. And that also makes it so they're rare. And so, blah, blah, blah. so we can kind of extrapolate based on that. I don't hate that value, but I think you know the rise of speculation, of, of stock market speculation, gives birth to all these other you know, uh, political theories. I think that's something to note at the top here. So I'm just to give a brief history. So organized credit, as we know it, appears in the 16th century and almost right away market manipulation emerges in, you know, 1530, all when the main markets emerged in Antwerp and later made Netherlands the financial capital of the world. Like I said, that's because the, the book says a lot of Jews were chased there and a lot of people in the Netherlands will probably tell you that, but that's why it happened. Um, so, and the idea of shares, shares of a company started as uh, what's known as a joint stock company, which is basically uh, one example of this was when um, a bunch of rich people said they found treasure somewhere. There was a <laughs> big rush around this time of excavating and, and, and raising up these shipwrecks. There was all these stories of shipwrecks, right? So it's like, we got to need a lot of money to go find this ship, this Spanish galleon that was carrying gold bullion and it sank, because whatever. And we're going to raise it. And if you give us money now to do it, you'll get a share of the profit. So that's how this all started in a very practical way as a treasure hunt. Some of the most significant early colonies, including Jamestown, Roanoke, and Massachusetts Bay, were founded by corporations called joint stock companies. Joint stock companies were sort of rudimentary corporations. And the distinctive thing about English colonization is that the government did not have the means or the inclination to fund it. So corporations raised money by selling stocks. Investors would be rewarded with gold and natural resources found in the new world. And then, you know, if they don't find the treasure, you lose your money and you're fucked. So one way to conceptualize shares is just a more advanced version of that. Like I'm, I'm buying a part of you now, hoping that you succeed later. So think of it as an adventurer raising a Spanish ship and finding just a bunch of bones. Yeah. You know, that's the last thing you want to find is a bunch of Spanish bones. I, I would like to point out, this is just normal business investment. And people who don't think that this is business investment don't understand business investment. Because the, the fact that this is an investment in an enterprise which may turn a profit, but in all likelihood will not turn a profit and you will spend the rest of your life in a debtor's prison in the year 1780 is, is normal business. And that is what business owners deal with. And that's the reason that usury isn't always immoral. Yeah. So and, well, and that's the thing. So th then this is just like a, an investment. I wouldn't even say usury because that's like a loan where you get interest on. That's like a different thing. This where this goes bad is where you get market manipulation. So here's the trick. A lot of this stuff on its own, like investors is fine. Where it goes wrong is when these joint stock companies hire a bunch of marketers and salespeople to drive up the price of stocks or to manipulate people into something. Because then you could say, they're they're gaming the system. They're just lying to people. And so what you don't like is the lying. What you don't like is the marketing of a company that is you know, snake oil. But, that's what yeah, snake sure. oil is. We already have laws against fraud, right? Why do we need special laws against? against well, that's the thing. Like, we back then there fraud. wasn't. 
Yeah. Yeah. Back then they had to make new laws because they said, well, what if we just tell them that's big? Then we'll, we'll get out of town. And back then you could get out of town a lot easier on a Spanish ship that doesn't sink. <laughs> um, so, um, so just, to, I'm just going through some history here because I found this stuff interesting about how it all started because it didn't start that long ago. Um, and so what, another thing that happened was the bank of England started by loaning the, the English government over a million pounds, which the government would pay back in a hundred thousand dollars of interest annually. And that was kind of how paper money got invented. So again, a lot of this stuff isn't old. And the idea of you know, the bank of England and all these banks starting as central banks was once again, I'm sorry, kind of a Jewish invention, <laughs> but um, one of the stories of, of the entire development of the uh, financial marketplaces is that the role of central banks in loaning the government money to you know start circulating it and circulating it as their own loans. And now the government owes that central bank money is just kind of paying interest on it. And that's the relationship they have. And then you say, well, who owns the central banks? Well, we covered that in one of our clips that got taken down on YouTube. <laughs> so, you know, if you want well, to talk central private banks, individuals, sorry, I guess this is going to get taken down now too, but yeah. <laughs> cosmopolitan individuals, private individuals who, and this is actually just on the topic of central banks is that a lot of the booms and busts in the uh, 20th century, like the Great Depression in America, but also globally, they happen because there were stories going around that the age of booms and busts is over. The age of bubbles is over. The age right before the Great Depression, all you would hear is that depressions are done. We'll never have one again because there was depressions and, and recessions before that. But they said, we have this thing called the Federal Reserve. We have this thing called all these central banks. And their job is to actually make everything more stable, to be a check and a balance on the system. So one trend you see throughout the Western world for hundreds of years is that every time there's a boom, and every time there's a, a rush of mania, every single time they're saying this is different because we're not going to have recessions and depressions anymore. Busts are, this is something that happened in, <laughs> bust, this is something that happened with the dot-com boom. More recently, in the 90s, if you go back to the dot-com boom, where the you know, tech stocks were up and everyone was making money hand over fist, you can find articles written that, hey, they're saying this is a bubble, but we are post-bubble. There's no bubbles anymore. This is a di this is a different world, a different thing entirely. It's the singularity, every single man. Time. Infinite growth. Yeah, every and I the only reason I say that is because it's very recent. You could probably still find articles saying that a lot of people are saying this is a bubble, but we don't have bubbles anymore. We fixed it. But go back not even that long because the the chain reaction of booms and busts. There's the only different sizes, but you can find recessions and depressions going back. You know, every decade or so, and every single yeah. time they say the exact same fucking thing yeah. that we've we've tweaked it. We've got this thing called central bank. We have all these systems in place, and then you know, if you want another one, the housing crisis. Every single like go. I'm old enough to remember the same articles and the same economic professionals saying that we don't live in a world anymore where we can have bubbles bursting. And now you got times, you got sorry. MMT, you got modern monetary theory, right? And this has taken hold with like Kamala Harris and AOC and people are supporting this. The general idea is that uh, there's no such thing as a depression or a recession anymore in the U S because of uh, U S dollar supremacy and any loans that they make and debt that they get into, they owe it to themselves. So you can print as much money as you want. As long as you're not too stupid with it, you can make, there's no such thing as inflation. There's no such thing as debt. There's no such thing as depression. Just don't worry about it. Well, first, let me say that what we argue is that a sovereign government that issues its own currency is actually nothing like a household or a firm, even though we hear this analogy all the time. If a government issues its own currency, um, and uh, imposes tax liabilities or other kinds of liabilities in that currency and uh, spends only in its own currency and issues debt only in its own currency, then it basically can never run out of money. That is the, the basic of the argument. And they're, they honestly believe this. And you got fucking Congress people and senators now that believe this shit, which means we are very close, like counting the seconds to the fucking biggest crash in a hundred years because 
Yeah. Never believe anyone they say it can't happen Mm -hmm. because you're just going to be the one who ends up eating your shoes. You know what I mean? Like, and this is what we're going to talk about later about predicting the unpredictable, but yeah, this is, and throughout history, you saw reactions to this. Like every time there is a huge depression or a huge bubble bursting, there are people who try and tweak it. This is where, you know, during this period of growth, you you saw Adam Smith and the economic boom in America led to the development of the free market ideology. Um, But all manias essentially remain the same. And there is an example here where just to give, and they're not going to like this, but just to give some, a nice little check mark, a good job star was, um, you know, the rampant speculation on uh, railways. So this was something that happened in, in England, in the UK, where it's an example of a this free market hypothesis run amok. And yes, there was corruption. Yes, there was speculation. Yes, there was all the bad stuff that goes with, you know, free market laissez-faire stuff, you know, people making money, people going broke, whatever. However, the book does note that the UK did end up with the most railways. (laughs) You know, at the end of the day, even though it was chaotic, even though it was corrupt and bad, you know, at around the same time, many, many countries were building railway systems to various levels of government uh, centralization. So in some countries, the government ran all the railway construction and Britain famously didn't. It just said, I'm going to leave it up to private people, build build it wherever the fuck you want and you sort it out. And this is more of a Milton Friedman way of looking at it because Milton Friedman created what's called the efficient market hypothesis. The efficient market hypothesis says that the price of a stock fully reflects all of the publicly available information out there. And since the current price of that stock reflects all of the information out there, well, it's only the new information that will ultimately move the price of the stock. And the efficient market hypothesis goes further by stating that since a stock price already reflects all publicly available information, it's impossible to beat the stock market from a performance perspective over the long run. Total market liberalism and the belief that all investors and speculators are rational agents. Now, I don't agree with that. However, the result of all this chaos was that Britain had the most railways out of any country and that they had better railways. So I'm just saying, like, uh, you know, we can critique free market stuff all we want. However, you know, there is within the chaos that did kind of end up with more of the thing you wanted eventually yeah so just to and in the process of getting the railways a lot of people lost their lunches a lot of people lost their jobs but one way of framing that is a bunch of pussy ass retards lose their lunch so that we can have cool trains so i mean i'm i'm all, I'm all right with that yeah and, and just to bring it back to like what causes all this like a mania a mania starts not just with lies and stuff it starts with the fact that people want a thing or a company is doing something that's good. So like a media starts with something exciting, which leads to positive feedback as excitement rises. And then what they call euphoria as the feedback looks good. You know, everyone's getting paid. Everyone's. So usually it's like uh, the tulip mania. The tulip mania was the best example of this. So this is one of the first manias that people talk about where tulips just fucking skyrocketed in price. By 1623, the price for a single Augustus Semper tulip bulb was worth a thousand guilders. By the end of 1625, that price had risen to 3,000 guilders. To put this into perspective, a skilled artisan such as a carpenter would earn about 300 guilders per year. A billion dollars per tulip just because they were hard to grow and they looked good. No one really, there was no real intrinsic value to a tulip. But pe- there's just something happened. People like them. And then you created a positive feedback loop and then money went up. And once there's this sort of euphoria, it takes on a, a life of its own. So you want to know how bubbles happen. So bubbles happen when, for whatever reason, it usually starts with something practical. I like a thing. Someone is doing a cool thing. Someone's raising a ship out of the ocean. And I believe in that. And then so you start building you start it's successful you start getting money then the second life is people just see a successful thing and want to be a part of it that's kind of what bitcoin happened well went through bitcoin was it starts off with a lot of people who believe in the technology believe in cryptocurrency and believe it's good and understand they get in early and then as it starts to rise there's still people who believe in it and i think there's more people now who believe in it as a necessity that we'll need 
However, there's a lot of people in cryptocurrency who are only there because they heard it's a big thing happening or they figure that they can get rich and they just want to get rich and they just want to be a part of this big, cool thing. That's where it goes out of control, to be honest. That's where you get the momentum buyers where like, I'm trying to buy low and sell high and you're just doing micro transactions and day trading on it. So, you know, that's, that's the second phase, but that's where things start to lose control where people, people are easier to scare that way too, where if they get a sense that, oh my God, the, the euphoria is ending, you know, you're just a guy coming down off of Coke and then you panic sell and that just drives it in the fucking ground. That's kind of, that's what happened with tulips. That's why tulips, you know, how many people lost their shirts because they got in too late buying tulips, borrowed money to buy them. Then within a day, they're worth nothing. And then people like there's stories of like barons. There's stories of guys who are captains of industry who killed themselves because, you know, what I mean, like they just they 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 went in big on tulips and within a day they're worth a few cents. Yep. Yep. So be, and, and really the argument was it hasn't really changed. Nothing's really changed. It actually starts these these booms like it gets confusing with all the numbers and terms. But really. In an almost spiritual sense, this is why people do it and, and nothing's really, really changed. And this is what companies do where they overextend. That's where these these bubbles burst happen, where it's like, oh, th the good thing is going to go on forever. You know what I mean? They say they split it down into two types of people. There's, you know, the forecasters who are trying to predict the future. And then there's the speculators trying to predict the future. And the investors want to maintain the present. And these are the two types of people involved in every bubble. These are two types of people involved in the market. And so the speculator is always saying, I don't give a fuck the present. I want money tomorrow. So they'll sab they're will they more willing to sabotage something that's happening right now that's going good. But the investor wants to, whatever's happening right now, to stay this way forever. <laughs> that's where investors get fucked up by thinking that, oh, it's going good now. Why would it be bad later? And that's more of a deeper human fallacy. I yeah, think that biased. deep, de yeah, deep down, despite all the evidence, despite all of the research and very intelligent people being involved, we still think that change isn't going to happen, and we still think we're not going to die. Very, very smart people. If you were to ask them, they would say that yeah, everyone dies, but deep down. I think that people secretly believe they're not going to die and secretly believe things can't get that worse. I think that's why th this thing happens at all. <laughs> that's yeah, kind of exactly. the thing I was trying to get with. Um, just a, a few terms people might have heard. And I'd just like to make sure, because I didn't know a lot of these terms, you know, like what is a bull? What is a bear? What is, what's the future, right? So a bull, if you hear this in the, in the news or anything, a bull is someone who lifts something up and is positive. I'm a bull because I want to invest. I want to save a company. I want a company to go public. I'm I'm spending bullishly. And a bear is a cynic ruled by fear and uh, trepidation. So, you know, in the book, they said this is manic versus depressive. You know, it's a bull market. You're big on investing and you're a bear market. So you're defensive and you're trying to hold on to stuff. So he's like, yeah, you, the market is a manic depressive entity. Um, when you hear people talk about a put, what is a put? A put is a deal to sell stock at a certain price at a later date. So I'm buying it now. I'm making a put. I'm going to hope it goes up later. A future is buying something now for a future date, assuming that the price is going to go up. Um, and stocks and futures are basically financial derivatives that speculators use to make bubbles. It's bets on the future. This is where we get trying to divine the future from. Uh, a bond is a government debt on a loan consolidated into something people can buy. So like we said before, the Bank of England lends the fucking government some money. They loan it out. You're a bond. So you're buying part of the government debt, hoping that the government repays that back consistently because what's more stable than the government paying back its debt? So when you hear a lot of uh, financial problems going on with the American government, a lot of the time it's you're listening to like someone who's taken, who's trying to pay back their own loan and doesn't know how. <laughs> They're frantic. Like, what are we supposed to do? They're going to break our knees. You're thinking, well, how can the how can the global financial system break a government's knees? Oh, wait. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, 
And this is where you get stuff like margin calls, where brokers, they take out loans based on stock they own and keep leveraging up and up. They keep borrowing upon things they've borrowed. It's where this extrapolates and gets exponential, where you're leveraging based on loans, based on futures, based on this and that. And then when something goes wrong, everyone starts to like call in all this, the money that's out there and there's not enough money. There's literally not enough value attached to the loans that are made. And so when you hear like, oh, my God, they're calling back. You know, there's that movie I love called Margin Call with uh, Kevin Spacey, where this is what happened with the housing market. They they took out loans based on loans. And it's like, oh, my God. So if they call back their money, the money we owe is worth nine times more what the firm is worth. So we can like if, if, if one thing goes wrong, everything falls apart. And it very nearly did. So you wonder how things like that happen. That's how that happens. And I won't get too much into like the history of money because we kind of already covered that about how it's to keep sort of debt circulating and how, you know, then there's reactions, like we said, with bubbles where, you know, we have the Adam Smith, you know, free market hypothesis and you have the Milton Friedman sort of efficient market hypothesis where if you leave everything alone, everything solves itself. Then you have Keynesian economics where that came after the stock market crash. So Keynesian economic theory is the, this led to the separation of commercial and investment banks. Cause they used to be one type of bank. I think they are now actually, because there was an act to separate them and then they repealed that act um, to try and limit the, the, the expanse of speculation. So Keynesian economics was the belief that the government needs to be more involved. There needs to be more regulation. Right, so Keynes devised this economic theory that government should actually spend money during recessions when the economic situation is bad in order to put money back in people's pockets. And well, how does a government do that? A government can do that by spending money on putting people back to work. You can't just have... You know, people doing whatever the fuck they want that leads to monopolies, that leads to corruption and rampant speculation that just makes your average person suffer. And so when you hear about, you know, Keynesian economics, that's kind of what people mean from my reading anyway. I don't want econo economists on my fucking ass saying I read it wrong. I didn't read it wrong. Even if I am incorrect, I am true enough. Um, actually, actually, it's uh, it's Keynesian. Shit. Mm. Gotcha. You you sound too pleased with yourself right now. <laughs> but, uh, well, and here's the funny thing that uh, even Milton Friedman, I believe, like there's a lot of claims that speculation didn't lead to the stock market crash at all. You mean that's the, actually a, a you mean the, the 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 big crash, the big one? Yeah, yeah, the uh, the Great Depression. Yeah, it, I mean, my, say, oh, my was... opinion is it wasn't. I agree with Friedman. It was it was the banks, it was the Fed that caused it, not the uh, it wasn't speculation. Yeah. So uh, just from the book, it says um, Charles Kindleberger, viewing events from a more international perspective, saw the, saw the depression as a result of declining commodity prices and the failure of the United States to adopt the role as international lender of last resort to European nations. Um, and here's another part. Uh, not all economists and historians have been convinced by Milton Friedman, the monetarist economist has claimed that the stock market crash in 1929 was a momentous event, but it did not produce the great depression and it was not a major factor in the depression severity. Instead, Friedman blamed the federal reserve for following an overly restrictive monetary policy, which caused the stock of money to decline by a third between August, 1929 and March, 1933. So just to give people a, a quote, so like it's not a given that speculation caused the Great Depression or really causes any depression. That's what they say. I'm not saying I agree with that. But it must be nice, right? It, it must be nice for a government who fucked up that badly to be able to blame it for 100 years on a private bank, which has since gone defunct. That must be nice. So yeah. yeah. And it's so once you get into this, so people will say, well, what about this? But you can actually watch old Milton Friedman clips of his speeches where he essentially says the same thing. He was pretty old at the time. And the clips might have been from the 80s, early 90s. But, you know, he was the original. I think actually fucking Ben Shapiro was following Milton Friedman's lead where he would just go to schools and he would uh, say, Here, here's what I believe. Here's my monetary theory. And they would have just cool students get in front of a mic you know there's a lineup and they would just give them questions and i just remember one where it was like this like a really cool black guy like a Jimi hendrix looking a big afro 
and also of the colonial relationships of the Western European countries and the wealth which they bled out of the people in their col colonial domain. I will be glad to answer those questions. <laughs> A jean jacket that's up to like a like a woman's jean jacket, I guess. I guess that was something back then. <laughs> and a lot of scarves. I don't know how much of the I may have dreamed this guy, but <laughs> he's just there. It's like, huh? hey yo, crack a jack. Hey, jive mama. Is this Joe Biden now? <laughs> just Joe Biden in blackface and Milton Freeman, sir. <laughs> <laughs> doing the thing where he just points his chest. I can't. Who sent you? In here? <laughs> this is all Milton Freeman's, <laughs> Freeman's idea of planning Joe Biden. The more clips I see of Joe Biden from the past, the more I think he would do that. Like old Joe Biden, old jo Joe Biden back when he looked like a different guy, by the way. If you look at old Joe Biden, he's he's plumper. He's so and old. He looks better now, if that's possible. He will talk about kicking a pregnant black woman to death, Joe Biden. I love I, – there's some clip from him in the early 80s of him at some congressional hearing, totally out of context, but shouting into the mic, we don't want any more black folks in this district. And I just thought that was like the greatest thing. I mean, you know, he based Joe. Look, I think the best thing America ever did after Trump, which was a masterful stroke of hilarious things happening, was electing a retarded ghost. Mm -hmm. Like elect because a ghost already doesn't know. You talk. Have you talked to a ghost? I've talked to a ghost. A ghost doesn't That's know the where worst. he is. That's right. A ghost is he doesn't know where he's coming or going. He doesn't know. He mm -hmm. just knows this is his house. He recognizes mm -hmm. the White House. Yeah. And then he just says things into an ice cream cone. It's this is the best thing that's happened. He's going to do a little trolling, but you can't blame him. He doesn't even know why he's doing it. It's just his nature, right? I wondered what they were going to do to top Trump, and they did it. And I was skeptical at the start, but I'm just loving this roller coaster ride of watching this guy. I don't know about anyone mm -hmm. else. I am checked the fuck out. I'm going to kill myself. And then so there's other history here, like John Law and his system of companies saw money as a medium of exchange rather than anything tied to intrinsic value. So there's this debate throughout the centuries of like, what is money? Is it actually tied to gold? Is it tied to anything of value or is it just a medium of exchange? And are we just measuring the success of our exchanges, which in a lot of ways is what we judge now. So we're not even talking about trading value. Forget labor theory of value. Forget about value, period. All we care about is that money is changing hands. And that's kind of what speculation is now. It's like we talked about before, like what causes people to invest? They're excited about something and then people try to monetize that excitement. So we're just putting a magnifying glass on that part of we're trying to monetize excitement. You know what I mean? And this is where stuff like antitrust laws and insider trading get very difficult because the crypto market allows you this right now. People kind of founding shit coins and just trying to drive the price up by generating excitement through influencers, trying to generate excitement through articles being written to find some guy who works for Zero Hedge to write something <laughs> about it. Then it goes up, then you buy it. So you're just... You're manufacturing excitement. That's that's what yeah. it is now. And that's where people are kind of confused by this. Like, how do we get to this point? What is what is money? Wait, what the fuck is? Am I supposed to like gold or hate gold? Because I don't. I think I'm supposed to like gold, but is that even on the table now? Right? Are, are we so far gone into a different paradigm? That's kind of what I was trying to trying to figure out. And just one last case study here that I liked. It was um. We can chart the course of the rise of credit over the 20th century and in a lot of the world and not just in the West, but a lot of the world. There was we can see that there was a stable pre-credit world, in, but places like Japan bought into it fast with low interest rates and uh, sort of a love of consumer goods. Um, and what we saw with Japan was that, you know, they 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 got under credit. We look at a pre credit rush world and then we look at a post credit rush world and japan was had a different mindset about its economics and we think about japan you think about a place that has a stronger relationship with its ancestry with its past and everything but it fell the exact same way a lot of western countries fell right so japanese capitalism was different from the west because the people were different even the corporate culture 
you know, we see, we say, oh, there's a rise of corporate culture in Japan, but it still was more like feudalism. It was corporatism, corporations with a feudalist mindset, a lot like their organized crime is still very ancient and feudalist. So it actually ended up closer to fascism, in my opinion, the way they decided to run their uh, entire economy was closer to a fascist government than a laissez-faire American government um, and had a lot of rules on it and a lot of cultural stigma against short-term gain. And they, they had a more of a cultural desire for lo- what they call long-termism that, you know, you don't just like buy low, sell high as fast as you can and just stack those transactions algorithmically. That's bad. That's, that's evil almost. Um, and, but it was primarily politicians and banks who were into it first and they were the ones who actually fucking ruined it. You know what I mean? So if you look at how Japan became almost identical to America, despite being a different people, despite being a different culture, despite having a different social organization, the reason it fell the same way was actually in this case, because of elites, you can't really lay it at the feet of the people. Cause that's what I'm trying to get to that. You would say, Oh, okay. If we add power centralization to this, if we just take it out of the hands of the people and introduce it to these people with better heads on their shoulders, they won't fall for the same problems, but they did is what I'm saying that yeah. it doesn't matter if you are a politician, it doesn't matter if you are an institutional actor you know, who has got access to more information, you will still make the same retarded d- decisions and trying to buy a low sell high and game the market as an individual would. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I would try to say that the using Japan as an example, it's not necessarily an institutional problem. So when I started this, I'm trying to track down the problem of trying to lazily divine the future while lazily thinking the present can last forever. <laughs> And all these other deeper psychological things. I'm like, I don't think it's a thing you solve with government. It's not a thing you necessarily solve with nationalization using Japan as an example. Uh, That's all I just I kind of wanted to end it on was just exploring the history of why we do this before we get into the next things and, you know, track the history of like every mania being essentially the same of the motivations to speculate and the motivation is thinking that this will last forever being essentially the same, but using different language after every time it inevitably collapses and think you've gotten it all sorted out. I guess that's all I, I wanted to say about that or anything, uh, anything you have hubris, to say about that? man. Yeah. It's just hubris. Yeah. And it gets more dangerous to me because while the language changes, it is true that the technology changes and the ideologies change and the paradigm in a certain sense does change. But I think it makes it more erratic with the addition of technology and the addition of progress we have made in, in various intellectual spheres, academic spheres. The problem remains, but the scope of things that can go wrong has expanded and what you stand to lose has expanded. You know, like the proliferation of knowledge about this has not made it safer. The proliferation of knowledge of this thing has gotten more people involved, added more leverage and added higher stakes. Like you were saying before, like our current monetary state in a globalist world, there's so many more things that can go terribly wrong. It's so much faster and in such quicker succession. And that also, in my opinion, we'll get to this next time, increases the likelihood of unpredictability. Because we're already in a paradigm where we've already agreed that we're not even talking about actual value anymore. We're talking more about speculations on debts and loans and the the, the, more systems for which we can hype things up and lie to each other and manipulate each other just for the fucking sake of it. Like if you think how, how many crypto grifters do we know? And these are just guys who probably grew up poor. So it has nothing to do with economic class. You are just as likely to manipulate and fuck people over. If you're a yeah. poor guy who got into Bitcoin early than anything. It's to the point where from a strategic, you know, perspective, it makes more sense to add this new first level to the game, which is you look at all of the different, you know, meta games that you're playing, you figure out which ones of those are totally impossible to predict and you just step back from them. You just leave, you know, you, you cash out of all of those games and you only play the ones you focus your resources on playing the ones, you know, you can win in the short term and you turtle essentially because there really isn't, I mean, 
between COVID and Ukraine and the banking system and a million social media and a million different things. This and we're not even talking directly on the, on the financial. The actual financial system itself has been obfuscated like this for thirty years at least, and now this is uh, bleeding into the rest of the world into our normal social interactions. Like you can't, you cannot trust your own best predictions or I don't know. It's 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 crazy now. It's a crazy thing we call bucks. <laughs> Hey, yeah. hey, all we're trying to do is uh, heighten buck breaking. <laughs> do not let the rapists win. Listen and love Blood Satellite.